In this episode of Scaling Postgres, we talk about Postgres 14 Beta 1, PG14 Improvements, Best Primary Keys, and Composite Keys. I'm Creston Jamison, and this is Scaling Postgres, episode 166. All right, I hope you, your friends, family, and coworkers continue to do well. Our first piece of content is PostgreSQL 14 Beta 1 released. This is from PostgreSQL.org, and they're announcing that the Beta 1 is now available for you to test out and install and try. It mentions a number of highlights here covering different areas of performance. Some of the ones that were particularly of interest to me is that having uh, the large number of connections allow the database to oper operate more efficiently, potentially without using PG Bouncer. Whether those connections are in an active or idle state, there's been enhancements to partitioning and the Postgres foreign data wrapper, as well as reduced bloat on tables with frequently updated indexes. There's also improvements in uh, data types and SQL. So one of the interesting things to me about here is the new subscript syntax that is possible with uh, work when working with JSON but definitely a lot of other improvements. Areas of administration, particularly with regard to vacuum and how it operates and including the new idle session timeout capability, as well as uh, replication recovery and security improvements. So if you wanna get an idea of what's coming in Postgres 14 in the fall, you can definitely check out this blog post. The next piece of content, an early look at Postgres 14 performance and monitoring improvements. This is from pganalyze.com. And they looked at a number of areas of the new Postgres 14 that's in beta 1. And the first thing they looked at is the uh, active and idle connection scaling that was done in 14. And the yellow line represents Postgres 13.3 and the black diamonds represent the Postgres 14 beta 1. And you can see Postgres 14 maintains its connections better than 13.3 did, but not to a degree that was presented in the previous post. So this previous post where they talked about the patch, you could see a much greater improvement in the TPS maintaining consistency out to around 10,000 connections, whereas previously it was falling off much more before. But we don't really see that with the test that they did here. So not really quite sure what's going on, if it's because it's still beta 1 and there's maybe debugging set up or if there's something different about the configuration that was done, not sure, and they don't really mention it in this post. But they do say that even with their testing at, at 5,000 connections, it was a 20% improvement in TPS and a 50% improvement in TPS at 10,000 active connections. So an improvement that they've demonstrated, but not as dramatic as the one that maybe people were hoping for, or maybe again, it's just a configuration or because it's still uh, beta one. The next area they looked at is memory use with the PG backend memory contexts. So this is a new view that you can get information about your connection and even specify a particular connection with this function to be able to print out a given PID of a connection to get information about the memory that's logged to Postgres's logs. So you can get an idea of how memory is being used. Next area they looked at is some monitoring where there's a new pgstat wall that gives you an indication of how many wall records have been produced, how many full page images, how many total bytes have been written. Now my understanding is that this is cumulative. So basically you would have to reset the stats periodically to get these to reset, but it's a cumulative indication of what's going on. So you could find this beneficial with resets to track the state of your wall generation over time. And then they mentioned the new uh, query ID. So this is present in PG stat statements, but this capability in Postgres 14 allows you to turn computation of the query ID on. So here they're making a configuration setting change. And now it appears in the PG stat activity table. So you can track, these are essentially the same plan, even though the query varies by these parameters it's to the internal system, it's going to be producing the same query plan. So you can do something interesting and see, okay, out of the active queries in PGStat activity, what query ID is the most common? So you can see this query ID is using up most of the connections. So it definitely highlights a number of improvements coming in Postgres 14. So I encourage you to check out this blog post to learn more about these specific features. The next piece of content 
UUID, serial or identity columns for PostgreSQL auto-generated primary keys. So basically, to me, this is which auto-generated primary keys are best to use. Now, the first thing they talk about, you can go with what's known as a natural primary key. So if you have a user's table and it has a unique username, well, you could use that as the primary key, or you could use the email address as the unique key for that table. The other possibility is to use a surrogate primary key or an artificial primary key. And a lot of application frameworks automatically generate these keys for you as the primary key, a surrogate primary key. So usually this is what I see. This is not as com common using a natural primary key. But this post talks about if you're using an artificial primary key, what's the best way to keep it updated, auto-generated? And there are basically two techniques that you can use. One is using a sequence of numbers. The other is using UUIDs. So for generating the sequence of numbers, the best thing to use is a sequence in Postgres. So it's a separate data object that generates a new sequence of a number each time. The other alternative is using the UUIDs, and in Postgres 13 and higher, you can use the gen random UUID function when you're creating the column for your primary key. So for example, with a UUID, you can set the default to be this function and classify it as the primary key. Otherwise, if you want to use a sequence, you can create an int or a big int, default it to the next value in the sequence, another function that uses sequences and designate it as the primary key. But you're going to have to have this sequence in place. Therefore, Postgres offers it some convenience data types that they're calling serial or big serial. And what that does is when you specify, say, a serial as the data type, it automatically creates it as an integer, creates the sequence, and then sets that default as the next value in the integer. So it does that for you automatically. And of course, a big serial uses a big int instead of an int. Now, there is a new way in Postgres to set up auto-incrementing integers with a sequence, and that's using identity columns. So basically, you say, name of the column, the data type is big int, generated always as identity with a primary key. And that essentially manages a sequence for you behind the scenes to give you an auto-incrementing column. And this is basically the way to go because it's the SQL compliant way of doing it. Now for completeness, they do mention you can use triggers, but that's definitely the slowest approach to produce this. And then they cover a few different questions that someone might have. So it says, should I use integer or big integers for my auto-generated primary key? And his argument is you should always use a big int because if you have a small table, the difference in size is not gonna make that much of a difference because you're not storing that much data, but if you have a big table, you have a real risk of running out of integers. So he definitely suggests always using a big int, and I definitely agree with that. Second question, should I use big serial or an identity column for my auto-generated primary key? And his response is you should use an identity column unless you have to support old PostgreSQL versions. Now, I would add to that that if your framework automatically uses the old syntax, I tend to use what my application framework uses. I don't want to kind of swim against the current or make things more difficult for myself. So, you know, when the time is appropriate, definitely move to the identity column, but they're still going to be supporting serial, big serial, things of that nature for quite a long time. Next question, should I use big int or UUID for an auto-generated primary key? And his advice is to use a sequence unless you use database sharding or have some other reason to generate primary keys in a decentralized fashion, basically outside the single database. So I agree with this as well. I always use integers for my primary keys. The only time I don't is if some other service is generating a piece of data that I need to store. So if a JavaScript client is responsible for creating a unique identifier, then I would create it as a UUID in my system because UUIDs have a number of performance disadvantages. Now, they did talk about here where they did some benchmarking and found it slower in some cases, but there can be some huge performance implications as your data sizes increases with generation of wall. And there's actually this post from 2018 in uh, November from second quadrant where they're showing how the amount of wall generated significantly increases mostly due to full page image writes. And the reason this happens is because of the random writes. So if you have a lot of data being inserted into a table with a integer column, it's just going to be keep increasing and usually just add it to the tail end of any indexes 
or the table as the data comes in. But if you have a UUID, those index insertions are very random across the entirety of the index. So you're gonna end up with a lot of bloat as well as a lot of full page image arcs because a lot of different pages are touched and need to be saved to the wall. So they were seeing significant hits to TPS and size of the wall with UUIDs compared to sequential IDs. Now, what this post talks about is there is a extension that allows you to generate semi-random UUIDs. So they're partially sequential at the beginning and then they're random at the end. And that made the performance of the system much better. So if you want to go with UUIDs and you're dealing with a lot of data, maybe you want to consider using this extension that gives you better performance, but still gives you kind of sequential random UUIDs. But definitely a great post talking about different options for auto-generated primary keys. So if you're interested, check out this post from cyberdeck-postgresql.com. The next piece of content, database design using composite keys. This is from endpoint.com. And since we're talking about auto-generated primary keys, this is an argument basically for natural keys. And in addition to using natural keys, he expands on it and says you could also use composite keys for your primary keys. So basically more than one column is in the primary key. And they give an example here of a typical company where you have departments and employees and say you need to add a new column to the department table that specifies the teams. And how would you do that if you were using a surrogate key for a primary key? And he's arguing that in a lot of cases, using natural keys is better. And when you do that, you could define a composite primary key that is composed of two different columns in that table. Now, some of the arguments I can agree with, but some I don't necessarily agree with. And you definitely can go this way and there may be some benefits to it, but some of the benefits I can see, it's not as much a benefit as he suggests. Like he's talking about performance considerations and that these natural keys could potentially use up more space and there's performance advantages to that. But whenever using more data, it is a hit on performance. But most of the reason that I haven't used this or explored this option highly, or it's very much on a case by case basis, is that my application frameworks automatically generate surrogate keys. And I've been able to operate my databases just fine using these surrogate keys and not using natural keys. Now, there may be certain cases where I might reach for them, but generally I tend to follow what my application framework does again, because I kind of don't want to swim against the current too much. But if you want to learn more about using natural keys, particularly composite ones with your database, you can check out this post from endpoint.com. The next piece of content is actually a YouTube playlist called Postgres Pulse. Now these videos were posted a while ago, but here is a convenient playlist. Each of them is about 30 minutes in length, and I think there's about 12 to 14 of them. So if you're looking for some Postgres video content, maybe you wanna check this out and see if there's any of this content that you wanna look at that you've potentially missed. The next piece of content, Postgres Google 14, substantial change to full text query parsing. Now, I think what they meant here is there's a substantial change to the full text query parsing. So basically there's been a bug in full text search where when you try to search on something like PG underscore class, you weren't getting the expected results. Like here's a web search to TS query where you're searching PG class space PG. And even though this text exists, it's false, so it's not finding it. So there's basically some, some bug in it. And they basically had to resolve this bug doing certain ways. As a result, you may get slightly different results from full text search in Postgres 14 based upon resolutions to this bug. So if you use a lot of full text search and you wanna be aware of any potential changes that may happen to the results of that, you may wanna check out this post to see if it would potentially impact you. So if you wanna learn more, you can check this out at Alexander Korotokov's blog at github.io. Next piece of content, waiting for PostGIS 3.2, ST underscore interpolate raster. So this is from crunchydata.com and they're talking about a use case where you have temperature readings, say across the state of Washington, and you wanna actually get temperature readings interpolated between where the measure measurements were made. And if you want to do that using a raster, there's apparently this new feature or, or function that enables you to do exactly that. 
and give you a gradient to interpolate where different temperature changes are based upon where the temperatures were actually measured. So if you want to produce something like this, maybe you want to check out this blog post. The next piece of content, porting array length from Oracle PLSQL to PostgreSQL PLPGSQL. This is from MigOps.com, and they're talking about a specific case where you're porting an array length check in Oracle in a function to Postgres where you get the entirely different unexpected answer. So if you are looking to migrate Oracle to Postgres and want to watch out for some gotchas, maybe you want to check out this post from MigOps.com. Next piece of content, PGO 4.7, the Postgres operator, PVC resizing, GCS backups, and more. This is from crunchydata.com, and they're talking about a new release of their Postgres operator for working with Kubernetes. So if you're interested in that, you can check out all the new features that have been added to this release. And the last piece of content, the Postgres School Person of the Week is Magnus Hagander. So if you're interested in learning more about Magnus and his contributions to Postgres, definitely check out this blog post. That does it for this episode of Scaling Postgres. You can get links to all the content mentioned in the show notes. Be sure to head over to scalingpostgres.com where you can sign up to receive weekly notifications of each episode, or you can subscribe via YouTube or iTunes. Thanks.